a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil can actually create a tornado in Texas. It's called the butterfly effect. Tiny little flaps all the way down there in South America can cause a chain reaction that propagates through a system that affects the weather patterns above our head. It's pretty fascinating. A small thing, a small event can have a large effect. When we saw in Acts chapter 9, when the Lord Jesus revealed himself to the Apostle Paul and converted his heart, that one event has had a massive effect on the face of the earth. We've seen how the gospel has gone through Israel, it's gone to Cyprus, it's gone to Turkey, which is Galatia, it's gone to Syria. And here, as we will see today, the gospel is about to make inroads into a new continent, the continent of Europe. Philippi is our background today, as the text will tell us, and it's a very important city throughout history. It's a city that's named after uh, King Philip of Macedon, who is the father of Alexander the Great. Uh, it's a city that has been fortified and rebuilt several times. Uh, the most perhaps profound time was by Octavian, the emperor of Rome, who some 40 years before Christ came, made the city essentially the second city of Rome. It was a very important city, but inside the Roman Empire, but far more than being an important city in the Roman Empire. Philippi will be remembered for all of eternity as the place in which the gospel was first preached in Europe. Uh, the, the place in which Paul brought the banner of Jesus of Nazareth into a new continent that would produce such fruit as people like Martin Luther, Charles Spurgeon, Amy Carmichael, and so many people. It's the gateway to the Western world. And so Acts 16 means a lot to us here in America because as the gospel enters this continent, it eventually found its way to us. And we celebrate that today. The main idea from our text is very, really simple. As the gospel began to transform lives in Europe, Christ's kingdom advanced and his church was established, demonstrating his power over sin and evil. I'm gonna leave that up there so that you can have time to write it down. As Christ's kingdom is, is advancing to a new continent, as his authority is spreading upon the face of the earth. Today, we're gonna to see three ways that he evidences his rule in Europe. As it starts small, beloved, with the conversion of one saint, but again begins to have profound effects. We're gonna see how he opens up people's hearts to hear his word. We're gonna see that he has authority over evil that had crippled this area. And we're gonna see how he converts people who don't even know his name to change allegiances completely. Beloved, this is what Jesus does if you follow him, is he changes you in your heart. He changes you into a people and he makes you different. So the first evidences of Christ's rule is found in verses 11 through 15. Jesus opens graciously people's hearts. And the first heart he's going to open is this precious woman whose name is Lydia. Look with me there in verse 11. So setting sail from Tro uh, Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained there some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the city, to the, uh, city gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you judged me to be faithful to the Lord, 
come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is undoubtedly, beloved, a providential encounter between the Apostle Paul and Lydia of Thyatira. See, Thyatira is in Asia, and as we saw last week, Paul was forbidden to go into Asia to preach the gospel. He was called uh, through a vision to go into Europe to do that. And so the fact that Lydia, who is from Asia, was in Europe to hear the gospel is nothing short of the providential encounter that God wanted to have with this particular lady on this particular continent. Thyatira was known for selling purple goods. This was an extravagant industry. Uh, selling hues and seams for magistrates and princes and leaders in certain cities across this part of the world. Lydia was more than likely a very wealthy lady, not only because she sold purple goods, but also because we see that she has a house big enough to house the church that starts here soon after. But she's there and uh, she's probably living in Philippi for some time. But she's of Thyatira. It's a short trek ap- across the Aegean Sea. So she's probably living in both places, more than likely, so scholars say. But she's in this country, and she's gathered, and she's able to hear the word of God. And prior to her conversion, the text tells us a few things about Lydia. She is a worshiper of God, as it says there in verse 14. She's more than likely a proselyte, a Gentile who was acquainted with the things of God, the scriptures, and was a worshiper of God, but she knew not the Messiah yet. Uh, She was someone who would have known that there was a Messiah, but did not yet know the Messiah. But she had already been tenderized by the mercies of God to worship the right God, but not know yet the full counsel of God. We know that she's devout, as it says there in verse 13, Uh, She's gathering to pray outside of the city, a place of prayer. As Paul and his companions go and seek a place to pray. There was no synagogue inside of Philippi. In fact, under Roman rule, it was was actually against the law to teach any religions except the state-sanctioned religion of mythology. And so not being able to have a synagogue, uh, there was a place of prayer. The reason there wasn't a synagogue is because there wasn't 10 men who could operate a synagogue. That was the rule of thumb. If there was 10 men who could operate, then there would be a synagogue, but there's not. So there's only a place of prayer and there's faithful ladies who are gathering. Isn't that encouragement, ladies, to your heart, that these ladies are gathering together to pray? And here they had no idea that this normal prayer meeting, they come across the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And look what happens there in verse 14. The Lord opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to what Paul was saying. So Paul is preaching the word at this prayer gathering and it is the Lord who opens Lydia's heart to respond. Beloved, Christian conversion takes place not when we open our own hearts, but when the sovereign Lord with his own hand opens our hearts. And the Lord intervenes and he changes the dispositions of our hearts. That means in this moment that God opened the heart of Lydia so that she could see for the very first time Jesus. Jesus who is able to save her. Jesus who has loved her from the beginning. Jesus who is able to forgive her of everything that she has ever done against him. And he does it. But notice what it says. It says he opens her heart in order for her to pay attention. That's what Jesus does. He opens up the heart, but she still has to respond in faith. She still has to repent of her sin, just as Paul still has to preach the gospel as he has been ordered to do. So in the mercy of God, he opens the heart and gives the ability for someone to respond in faith and repentance. And that's exactly what happens right here. 
to this woman. I'm compelled to you to this, today to preach to you, to preach to you about the gospel and, and to tell you all that Christ has done so that you too would repent and believe. That's still the work that is before us. And as the word goes forward, all of a sudden Christ claims his first person in this country to be a part of his kingdom. Now look at the fruit of her conversion. This is kind of proof that she's a new creation. Do you remember what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5? We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone and the new is come. Here's the evidence that a new person is now existing. She obeys the command to be baptized. In fact, she and her household there in verse 15. And this is evidence that she was trusting in the one that she was now identifying with, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in new life. Lydia hears the gospel and then she goes back to her household and she wants her whole household to know the gospel. This is the fruit of a converted heart. We'll talk more about baptism here in just a few minutes, but I also want us to see another fruit that, that jumps off the page there in verse 15. Her hospitality, she insists that these missionaries dwell with her. So thankful to God that she was able to hear the gospel. And she says to them, if you have judged me, meaning if you have believed that the, that, that the Christ has actually changed my heart and that I'm a new person, would you come and stay with me? Would you come and let me care for you? What a fruit, what a, what a, what a piece of beautiful fruit that is produced in this lady's heart, beloved, when the Lord comes into our lives and he changes us, he makes us look like him. He's a hospitable God and his people are hospitable people, willing to obey just as Christ obeyed the Father's commands. A few takeaways for us to consider here. And I want us to think about this. Paul goes into a city and his reflex is to immediately to talk about the eternal things of God at this prayer meeting. He's not able to convert Lydia. Paul's not. But he's obedient to preach the word and it's the Lord who moves in her heart. Uh, Lydia isn't able to just accept it on her own. She needs the Lord to open her heart and then she needs to respond. There's such an application for there to rest in being faithful and obedient and leaving up the eternal things to God. But remembering that he is able to do work in your heart just as he's able to do work in my voice as the word goes forward to you. This is how God works. I also want us to see here the importance of not neglecting the gathering that takes place all the time. This could have looked like just an, or, an ordinary, normal prayer gathering where a few ladies get together and they worship God the best way that they know how. But the Lord shows up. And the Lord shows up in an ordinary way with an extraordinary difference because the word of God goes forward into the heart. It's a reminder to us, beloved, that when God works, he typically does so in the, in the normal things. There's no such thing as a normal prayer meeting. God sustains us by his grace. He keeps us going by his mercy. If, uh, if one is not saved, that's where the, the salvation comes is when we gather and we preach and we teach and the word of God goes forward. Uh, if you do family worship in your home, don't ever think that a normal Monday is ordinary. Your kids might be yawning around the table. They might not be listening to you, but the Lord does extraordinary things in ordinary gatherings of his people. Encourage you to come to the prayer meetings when we have them. Encourage you to come when the, when the saints meet in community group and when the saints meet together because that's where God works. He works in our hearts as individuals. I'm not doubting that at all. We see that all through the scriptures, but there's something so sweet that happens when we gather. The Lord shows up and he strengthens our hearts. 
I don't want us to miss either that if this lady doesn't live in, in Philippi, she's still going with the gathering. She's still meeting with the people, with the saints. Beloved, we don't take the Lord off on Sundays. We don't rest from the Lord if you're on vacation or if you're in another town for business. Gather with the saints. Be with his people. I'm thankful for the example of Lydia and these ladies today. The second evidence I want to examine of Christ's reign in this new continent is Jesus' power displayed over the authority of evil. It might be a new continent, but it's the same authority. Same authority that was proclaimed in Jerusalem and now is spreading to the end of the earth. And so we move from a rich, free lady who has a big enough house to to house the church to a young girl who's enslaved. But the sovereign Lord displays his power over all things as is demonstrated right here. Verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. The ministry of these disciples, as it began to take root in the people of Philippi, It was found out by this slave girl who had a spirit of divination. Do you see that little phrase there in verse 16? The translation of that in the Greek is spirit python. Or the spirit of a python. In Greek mythology, the python guarded the temple of Apollo. And over time, the python came to mean that a demon-possessed person through whom now the python was speaking. So think about the context here. This is a little girl and this demon has possessed her and it's speaking through her and it's bringing this little girl's owners much gain financially because she's able to fortune tell. She's able to predict certain aspects of the future like a ventriloquist. It's actually where we get the idea of a ventriloquist is when a spirit would speak through a person able to make predictions. She's enslaved twice over. She's a slave to these people and then she's a slave to this spirit. Very, very troubled. I want us, beloved, to look at the tactic of the devil here. You see there in verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer. So after God worked in Lydia's heart, after he had worked in Lydia's family and staying there and ministering, they were going back to the place of prayer and look who meets them. It's this girl with the spirit in them or in her, excuse me. It might appear like this spirit python is agreeing with their message by saying things like, hey, these are servants of the most high God. And they proclaim to you the way of salvation, which are are true statements, but make no mistake about it. She is mocking the disciples and she is mocking the message. The spirit is mocking the message of the disciples, even trying perhaps to blur the lines of what, the spirit is able to do and, and making an agreement with the message that the, that the apostles are, going, are bringing forward. She's a, a major distraction. She's mocking and, and blaspheming. That's why Paul in verse 18 becomes greatly annoyed. It's a distraction from the ministry that is taking place at Philippi. And through Paul, Christ demonstrates, beloved, his authority over the kingdom of darkness. And he calls out immediately this spirit to come out of the girl. 
And you know what? This demon python obeys because Christ has authority over all things. His people, not his people, the spirit world and all things. And so this demon obeys. We don't know the salvific um, outcome of this little girl. Uh, Luke never gives the details. He, he never says that she comes to Christ. We do know that when Christ delivers, he typically fully restores. But that's not mentioned here, and so I, I'm not going to read too much into her salvation here. Because we, we, we really don't know, but I do want us to see a major category uh, that, that is helpful and the implications are good for us as a church family to consider today. Not necessarily what demon possession looks like or exorcism. Guys, I, I don't know much about that. I've never come face to face with a demon. I know faithful Christians have. What I do know is what Paul said that Christ has the authority over the demon. That's what I do know. And so beloved, if the spirit of God is in you and you belong to Christ, the same Christ that dwells in you has authority over anything that you encounter in this world. But I want us to recognize the tactic of Satan here. This, this primary tactic of distraction. That is what Satan does to his people. He meets them in the place. They're, they're going to church. And he meets them there. They, they move around and they talk about Christ and, and, and Satan follows them everywhere they go. I don't have to ask the question as to whether or not you have been tempted on your way to church with sin or with distraction or anywhere you go in the course of your day. This is what he does. He distracted Eve at the very beginning in Genesis 3 from God's word and put her eyes on a beautiful piece of fruit. And beloved, his tactics are still the same today. He's still hustling to distract us at every point. And we are so easily distracted, are we not? We're so bent towards the things of the flesh. He, he makes appeal to our flesh often. There's a lot of different ways that he tries to distract us and tried to, trying to name all of them would be impossible in this little sermon. But I do wanna call us today, beloved, to stay awake just as Paul's gonna do to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter four. We are to remain vigilant, faithful, undistracted from the things of God. Paul was annoyed and so he removed the obstacle that is what he does, and beloved, that is what we do. One small way, maybe this lands, maybe it doesn't, but one small way that Satan tries to distract us today is through music. The things that we listen to. Music has a very powerful effect on the human psyche, does it not? All of a sudden, you're singing a song, and you're like, I don't know, how did that get there? It has this really powerful ability over us. When words are stuck with melody, it's, it's amazing. Kurt and I were talking this week how those on their deathbed can sing songs. Uh, people who are struggling with something like dementia, they can sing songs that they remember, but they don't remember their children's names. Music has a major hold on us and, and music and, and things like music, sport, they, they can detract us from the things that God would have our minds set on. Beloved, I'd also give you a warning that the music out there today is dangerous. And I'm not some prude. It is dangerous because you know what the music industry is used for today? Powerful people who are making money off of puppets who are teaching you what you should believe. That's what happened in the music world today. We were in New York City recently, um, our family, for a couple of days on vacation. And we took a boat cruise uh, on the Hudson River. 
and uh, you can see everything. It's like an amazing view. You can see Jersey. You can see the Statue of Liberty. You can see Manhattan. You can see Brooklyn. And everybody's celebrating the freedoms that we have in this country, which are to be celebrated, no doubt. The song that they were playing as we got to look back on that incredible landscape was Jay-Z and Beyonce's song, New York. It's got a really catchy beat to it. Half of you are singing it right now in your mind. (laughs) Planted in the middle of that song are the lyrics, Jesus Christ can't save you, life ends when the church begins. If you are not bowing down to the king, you are not bowing down to the king. Satan tries to make inroads into our minds and our hearts all the time. Even us who are in Christ and safe. Beloved, we are called to be on guard, to stay awake. What controls you today? What distracts you today? Sports? personal fitness, entertainment. What, 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 a, what does your flesh want? Because that's what Satan is gonna use to take you away from the things of God. But I pray that we're like Paul. I pray that we're like Paul that just says, I'm annoyed, I want you out. So that the word of God can go forward in these people's hearts and remain in mine. And look at the implications of this deliverance and and this stand against evil. Paul goes from faithful preaching to a severe beating. Verse 19, but when our owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept their practice. And the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. It's interesting that the owners of the girl don't mention that they can't make money anymore off of her. They're now going, hey, Roman rule is these guys can't be teaching this. And so they appeal to what the Roman magistrates would be aware of, uh, would be, um, I guess, incensed about what they found out. And so what they do is they strip these men and they beat them with rods, an inch, really an inch of their life. So all was peaceful, beloved, in this city of Philippi until the gospel threatened Roman rule. That's why we submit to God and no kings on this earth. Kings of the earth can be a provision by God. We see this in Romans chapter 13. But our allegiance is to Christ. No matter who is on the ballot in November, our allegiance is to Christ. Just as Paul and Silas are demonstrating for us today. Now, by God's sovereign grace, even in the midst of this beating and them being thrown into prison, the Lord goes with them. Because he has a man he wants to save in the prison. And so he goes with them. And so we see this third evidence of Christ's rule in the new con- this new continent that the Lord Jesus is able to drastically change people's allegiance. Away from the kings of this earth to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. In a matter of a moment, unlike Lydia, who had known about some of the things of God, this Philippian jailer knew nothing of the things of God. And his knee was securely bent towards Caesar. Securely bent towards the kings of this earth, yet through the Lord's worth, we're going to see by the end of this little passage, his knee is bent to a new king. Verse 23, and when they had afflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet into the stocks. So the jailer received these men as prisoners, as people who are against Rome. So you can imagine, he's not putting their feet in the stocks gently. 
He's treating them as enemies of the state. But just notice, notice this powerful response of faith from the brothers whose hearts are, are so secured and fashioned to the Lord, verse 25. And it was about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Think about that. They're singing. These guys know they've been beaten. They know who they stand with and they're listening about how they're expressing their faith. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everybody's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. Beloved, this jailer was just moments away from hell. He was about to thrust a sword into his stomach or his heart and be totally separated from the love of God forever. His allegiance was to Rome. Whether he feared what, the Rome, what, what Roman legions would do to him because he lost the prisoners, or if it was a sign of honor that if you lost the prisoners as a jailer, it's best that you kill yourself so that your honor can stay intact. Either way, he is afraid of man and he is yielded to Caesar. And then Paul cries out, do not harm yourself. We are all here. Oh, that must have sounded glorious. It must have sounded like light coming out of pitch darkness. What did Paul care of this man? This man had treated Paul as a prisoner. And Paul cares about this man because Paul's heart had been changed to love Jesus. Christians, we should always want people to not harm themselves. And the reality is this this jailer in Philippi is a picture of every single person in this world who doesn't know Jesus. Do not harm yourself. One has been harmed for you. And it's at this moment of love that the jailer's allegiance changes. Look at his trembling there in verse 29. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That is a, law, that is a very quick and loud repentance, is it not? We, you're sitting there and he is so tethered to the grip of Rome that he's willing to end his life and abandon his family to where he now rushes in and he falls on his knees and he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the, the response is so beautiful. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your households Put your confidence in Jesus. Trust in his work. Don't worry about what Rome can do with you in judgment. Consider what God has done for you in the judgment of killing his own son for you. Paul saves this man's life and then Jesus saves his soul. How many deadbeat, self-centered, man-fearing, household abandoning men have God saved. Where he allows men like this jailer to hear the word of God and to change allegiance in the moment, in a moment of time. Some of you were such men. I was such a man. And he does that. In the midst of this darkness, this dark prison surrounded by robbers and thieves and um, murderers, the gospel light breaks forward in this man's heart. And he says, I'm, I'm ready. What do, what do I need, to, need to, to be saved? And 
This is what Jesus does. He, he comes in and he rescues a heart. He so changes a heart that a mind is moved from hailing Caesar and an earthly king to hailing the king of kings and the Lord of lords. This is conversion. This has happened when the spirit of God through the word of God breaks into a heart. A person becomes changed and different. And the bondage that they were under they is, is now given over to Christ who, who breaks the chains. Who, who, who can break addictions, who, who, who breaks the thoughts of bad marriages and self-centeredness and all of these things. This is what Jesus does. That's the power that the cross has when, he, when the cross is preached. And, and we see what believing means. Like the question might be like, what does believing mean? Well, we actually see the fruit of what believing means there in verse 32. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. We see in verse 31 that they were all baptized. And he took them that same hour of the night and he washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and his family. Then he brought them into the house and set food before them and they rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Beloved, that's conversion. That's what happens when the Lord breaks into someone's heart who is dead. They want to obey. What do I do? I believe. He's baptized. He and his whole house. They hear the word of the Lord. Verse 33. They hear the word of the Lord and they're baptized and they immediately obey. And then look at this. He recognizes that he has been cared for. And so he begins to care. He, he washes their wounds. He gives them food. He takes them out of their prison cell and up into their home, which is probably attached to the prison. And he's like, teach my family. Washing wounds and giving food. This is a new man. This is the power of our God. This is who our God is. And this is what our God does for people. He leads his family to Christ and away from Rome. We need to do the very same thing. We need to do the very same thing to teach our children the beautiful things of a kingdom that cannot be squelched of a kingdom that will live forever and a Christ who has saved them from everything they've ever done because he's a merciful God. If you believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. Men, are you leading your families like this Philippian jailer here? Are you leading them to Christ or are you letting them play with Rome? This is a faithful application for us. Have you checked your allegiances lately? Even those of us who are in Christ. I speak to you who are not in Christ and I speak to you who are in Christ. If you are not in Christ, change your allegiance today and the power of the gospel can actually do that. If you are in Christ today, the, the beautiful thing is you are in him and all of your sins are forgiven, but we constantly need to be reminded that we are prone to submit to other things. Turn back to the Lord today and be renewed and be encouraged that the God who loves you never stops loving you. I'm struck that both Lydia and the jailer go to their families with the gospel. I'm also struck that these men were singing in prison. They're singing the truths of God. It's a great example as to why we sing theologically rich and convicting songs. Because you might not have the scriptures with you one day. Do you have battle hymns in your family that you sing with your friends? Do you sing truth just as easy? Because when it's in your heart, it just spills out of you, does it not? That's why we do that here. I love, uh, Pastor Kurt reminded me of this quote by a pastor today. He goes, we don't sing worship songs about God giving you a sloppy wet kiss 
because that will not sustain you on the mission field when you have malaria. We preach the word, we sing the word, we read the word, we hold the word because the word testifies to us about the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And we sing truths about this. Now look at the aftermath very quickly. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And, they do, and, they, uh, and do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. Paul and Silas never had the opportunity to say that they were Roman citizens, which comes with rights. And we're gonna see later on in the book of Acts. So these men are terrified. The jailer gets them back into prison. He hears that they're let out. And Paul's like, you tell them to come here. Because God is a God who is just. And these magistrates didn't do their job to ask who we belong to in terms of an earthly citizenship. And so he makes them come out. And then look what we see there in verse 40. We see that there's a church. So they went out from the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. The church is gathering in Lydia's house, the church at Philippi. The saints have come. We learn of two of them, the, the jailer and Lydia. But there's brothers there, as it says there in verse 40. Beloved, this is the church that 10 or 12 years later, Paul would write to. It's known as the book of Philippians. And he would tell them, you are my joy and my crown. I have prayed for you, Philippians 1 Five, I have prayed for you from the first day until now. The day that Lydia was converted till now. He loved them. He he called them the people that held his heart. These people, as we see in Philippians 1, they were a mature church 10 or 12 years later. They had elders and deacons in place. They weren't just a house church anymore. Maybe they were gathering in a house, but they were a mature church. So this little work created a beautiful picture of the church for us as it spread further and further. Beloved, what does conversion mean for Lydia and the jailer? What does it mean for us? When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he can change our hearts. When we repent of our sin, we recognize that Jesus took our sin on himself, the judgment we deserved. And he died for us and he raised for us that we may walk in a new life with him. And this is, this is the gospel. And when we believe this, our hearts are changed. And Jesus' blood keeps us safe against the wrath of God. And then we display this just as these two people did today through baptism. It's a symbol of our entrance into the people of God, into the body of Christ. It's a sign of conversion and what happened in the heart when you believed and were converted in the name of Jesus. It's a sign of fellowship as one Baptist confession says. It's a a sign of fellowship in the death of Christ. You died with Christ. It's a sign of the resurrection of Christ. You, Romans 6, were raised to walk in new life. It's not just a moment of time and that's all. You now are in Christ through your conversion. You're actually brought into his body. Bobby Jamison says it's a sign that you are marked off from the world. That's what, you, what, what your baptism symbolizes. Spurgeon says don't make too little of your baptism, meaning like, Just don't be baptized and not be a part of the things of God and don't make too much of your baptism. It doesn't regenerate you. But it is a picture of what God did in the heart as displayed in these two people today. And then, beloved, we are put in the body of Christ. In Christ, Romans, or excuse me, Colossians 127 is also put in you and we are in him 
and he is in us and nothing can keep us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. You were adopted into his family. Once a child of Satan, now a child of the king. Children might be disciplined. Children might uh, take time growing up, but they're always in the house. They're always heirs of the promises of grace. Just like we ad adopt people into our home today. We should, Christians, we should adopt people into our home today. Just as we've been adopted into our families, uh, the family of God as displayed by these two saints. This is who we actually are. This is who Lydia and the jailer actually are. They're the people of God because he changed their hearts. Beloved, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that it would go forward and bear much fruit. We pray this today in the name of Jesus, our King. Amen.